Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Isabel San Martin. I'm an associate at King & Spalding based in the Paris office, and I practice um, both commercial investment treaty arbitration. Uh, as Rafa mentioned, I'm a member of the Global Advisory Board of the ICDR YNI. Um, and first, uh, thanks to Rafa for helping us uh, put this together. And special thanks to Amanda Lee and Yael Ripko, who've really helped me uh, organize this event. So today we're going to be discussing advocacy, um, or, or as, as we're calling it today, e-advocacy. And we're going to learn uh, about how to be more persuasive in virtual hearings. We'll hear about what things no longer work in a virtual setting and what we can do to be more effective. We're extremely lucky to have three excellent panelists who will provide different perspectives on advocacy today. Um, so first, we'll have the perspective of a coach on speaking skills. Then we will turn to the perspective of an advocate based on recent experience in virtual hearings. And then finally, we'll turn to the perspective of an arbitrator, who is the person who we ultimately want to persuade in a virtual hearing. Um, as Rafa mentioned, uh, there is a chat where you can uh, post questions during the panel. I will leave a little bit of time at the end and try to read a, a couple of those questions. Uh, so first of all, let me briefly introduce our panel. And first I am going to, here we go. There. So first on the coach perspective, we have John Falk. John is a coach at Fireside Coaching. He's been uh, based in Germany for 25 years and has experienced coaching in the legal sector for 15 years. He provides executive coaching business development uh, strategy. He helps also in um, deliver pitches and he supports lawyers in uh, partner track who want to improve their speaking skills. His main clients are top law firms, the big four consultancy firms and a variety of other companies in the private sector. Um, John has also been coaching teams for the GSUB and the Vismut for the past 10 years. And he is the founder of REM Tenet, the Center for Excellence in Mooting. Next, on the council perspective, we have Tom Sprange, QC. Tom is a partner at King & Spalding. He's the managing partner of our London office. Um, he is, uh, he's, sorry, he's been lead counsel in more than 100 international arbitration uh, under some of the main um, arbitration institutions. Uh, and he regularly appears as well before the High Court of England and Wales. Um, I think particularly relevant to our discussion today, uh, he's had some recent experience with virtual hearings and trials. For example, he participated in the first ever all virtual trial on the merits in the High Court in a case involving Kazakhstan. And he's also been, uh, he's also participated in a virtual application for injunctive relief and a hearing uh, before the Court of Appeal. And then lastly, on the arbitrator perspective, we have Professor Janet Walker. Janet is an independent arbitrator. She has, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> with chambers uh, in Toronto, London, and Sydney. She has served as sole co-arbitrator and chair in multiple arbitrations under the main uh, institutional rules. Janet is also a professor of law at Osgood Law School in Toronto, and she is the author of the main private international law text in Canada, which has been relied on in more than 350 judgments. As an arbitrator, she carries out her practice as normal through virtual hearings. Great. So I think you'll, you'll all agree with me that we are really lucky to have uh, such an amazing panel today. And I think with that, I will turn it over to John. He's gonna share with us some tips on how to deal with and prepare uh, for speaking in a virtual setting. And by the way, he has the most impressive looking microphone that I've ever seen. <laughs> I hope it works. Can you hear me? Okay. Am I on? 
Thank you, Isabel, for that warm introduction. Thank you, Janet and Isabel and Tom and uh, Luis and the whole team uh, for just inviting me here. It's August company here. And as maybe the only lawyer among you, I have to say uh, I'm honored and uh, pleased to be here supporting you in whatever capacity I can as a coach. Uh, so also welcome to everybody out in Zoom land. I hope you are safe and healthy wherever you're watching us tonight. And I trust that you are like me, uh, taking some of this COVID-19 time, downtime to reflect on how we can, uh, after the opening up period, maybe rebuild a little bit better world. So that's at least what I'm talking about with my kids every day. So Lord knows we need it. If I'm gonna just distill everything down that I'm gonna say in the next seven minutes or so to one sentence, I'll say this. Uh, the room is dead, long live the room. Or the room that you knew is no longer there. So what do I mean by that? I mean that uh, over the past few hundred years, we've done business and we've lived our lives in various rooms. You've got the living room at home, the bedroom at home, dining room, and then you go to work and you've got your office space with the reception area. And then the heart of every law firm, if you will, is really that beautiful oak table that is the conference room where you've got the windows looking out over the park or the river or the downtown Buenos Aires, uh, you know, traffic. And that whole thing is gone now. And we have tried to adjust over the last few months of lockdown by stitching together this, let's say a virtual patchwork of networks uh, and using Zoom and Skype and Teams and Blue Jeans and whatever all these things are called to enter these virtual spaces, these platforms, and have some semblance of our corporate life that we had before. People are meeting for, you know, weekly updates, daily updates I'm hearing. Some people are spending five to six hours a day online. I don't think I want to do that. Uh, and now we're moving into also e-advocacy and how do we do these hearings? How do we hold a hearing? Even before this whole thing started, uh, right at the very beginning in March or April, I, I remember somebody telling me that they had something going with uh, a case in London where they did all of the discovery, all of the hearings. It was a week and a half, and it was the most exhausting thing this person had ever experienced, just having to focus and listen and watch and be aware of all these things. So uh, the room is gone, and now the question is, is how do we then recreate that room effect with, without any of the artifacts, without any of the furnishings that we had, how do we create that ambiance online? Because the danger is if you don't do that, then people are just, they're gonna not engage in the way that you might need them to. Uh, so I have uh, put together one slide and I thought what we could do is take a look at this, just look at three rules that I've come up with and then walk through the sort of the cultural anthropological aspect of this and see what it means to sort of create a room and how, how we might do that. Isabel? Okay, so there we go. Thank you. Beautiful. So let's take a look at this slide for a minute. Try not to read ahead of me yet. I know that people do that, but I've really distilled it down to the basics here. At the top, I've got what I'm calling reflections on arbitral proceedings uh, virtually. And these are my version. This is my version of Asimov's three rules for robotics, right? I think three rules that we might want to just consider right now is one, you've got to get trained. All of us are in the process of sort of upskilling right now, learning, you know, how do we use the microphone? How do we share our screen? How do we, you know, look into that window right there, that tiny little window? It's so non-intuitive for people to look at something that's not really showing them anything. Actually, the screen is down here. So if I look down there at my slide, you'll see my eyes. But when we did the VIS trainings this year with all those teams, the number one skill besides the voice, of course, was training the eye on the arbitrator and acting like you're looking at them. Uh, really strange. So the second thing is we've got to use intentional uh, activities to create this electronic space and make it more of a warm, humane, human space. And third, we've got to find a way to make this positive. And one thing I'll already give you right at the beginning here is just to say, the dentists have figured out a way to make something very painful somewhat pleasant, right? And you, so you've got this, this delta between uh, the yoga class and the dentist. And somewhere in between there is the arbitral proceeding where we've got to run people through some procedural stuff and they've got to come out the other end with some kind of product, some kind of satisfying solution. And it's gotta be done in a way that 
has some sense of humanity so that people are you know, not passively watching and also not getting anxious. So let's walk through this. Just on the left, you can see what you as uh, arbitral practitioners and what I'm doing every day, we've got to learn how to just, you know, work our body. You've got to watch this magic triangle here. And then you've got to just not move around too much like this. No excess or hectic movement. Just try to relax the shoulders like in yoga class and just look right in the camera. The voice quality, I've got two things, clarity and articulation. Clarity, I mean, you've got to have some kind of a professional microphone system that works. A lot of people are saying you don't want to use a headset because uh, it just doesn't have the quality. I've got this for my ear and I've got this microphone for the voice. Uh, you can read all this online, so I don't want to talk about some of those uh, sort of superficial things, but they are important. Uh, last thing I'll say about voice is uptalk. This is something we might discuss later in the Q&A session, but uptalk is really the number one killer for a great story and a great pleading. Uh, uptalk is when you say everything as if it's a question and then you don't come down at the end of your sentence and you make a shopping list like we've got to get toilet paper and contact lens solution and you just keep going. And uh, this is a really dangerous thing because it, it makes people nervous and bored at the same time. They don't know when you're gonna to get to the end of your sentence. And you see what I'm doing? You've really got to come down at the end of your sentence and make a period and stop and a pause, and then it's done. And you go to the next thought. In terms of audience connection, we talked about this already. You've got to look right in that camera there. So that's really the number one skill you can practice at home. <laughs> Moving into designing the space, you've got to find a way to, you know, if you're still in lockdown full time, which I'm gonna be doing as well, I'm essentially renting out my son's room here while we create a studio in our living room for the next few years, you know, so I can coach people all around the world. Uh, you've got to find a, a connection between this, this business and the home environment and making it, making it sort of have this functional ambiance where people are comfortable joining you and you're being very hospitable and saying, come, come into my professional workspace here and let's get this job done. Helping that out are agendas, timelines, and goals. And more importantly, from a cultural perspective, you've got to have certain rituals that, uh, you know, how does it work? When you go to the dentist, you walk in, you give them your name, you go into the waiting room, you drink a little bit of tea or water, you brush your teeth, and then you go. And there's a certain sense of ceremony and ritual and procedure that you've got to have. That's got to exist as well in this virtual space. Finally, uh, you as legal practitioners, now you've got a new job. Uh, you've got to be hosts. You've got to be guides. You've got to be warm, friendly guides that just say people, tell people, okay, this is what's gonna happen. And then we're gonna do the hearing this way. And at the end, it's gonna happen this way. And at the end, you're gonna go home. You've gotta be really warm and welcoming. And this goes back to a book that uh, I was actually reading recently called Compelling People. And they say that the secret of compelling people is, you know, if you want to say that, in the, you can see it in two ways, compelling someone to do something or being compelling, right? The adjective form. Compelling people, they say, are people who possess a combination of strength and warmth. So you've got to bring these two things together. Strength in terms of maybe also legal competence and then warmth, meaning you've got to show empathy and humanity. This is what really connects with people and makes you an engaging speaker and also somebody who can lead a meeting. Finally, to end the slide, You've got to be asking these questions. Why should people even come? Why should I join the hearing? I don't want to do that, maybe. Why am I going to go in that space? Always start with the why, as they say. Uh, you got to give them a clear reason, and there's got to be a good outcome. Finally, why am I entering the space? Because it's a socially acceptable room, just like yoga, just like the doctor, just like going somewhere where there might be something a little bit uncomfortable, but we're going to walk you through this sort of invisible labyrinth of stuff that you don't even see anymore because it's already the, it's, it's the, it's the, the water that we swim in as fish. You know, when you walk in, of course, you go to the receptionist and give her your name and then you sit down. But that's a ritual, right? That's a structural thing that we've established. Finally, uh, people are going to be asking, how am I going to be treated? This is the Zoom version of what's in it for me. And, you know, am I going to look bad? Am I going to feel bad? Is this going to be strange and uncomfortable? We've got to make sure that people are prepared properly, that expectations are managed, that you are good guides, and that we make it as human as humanly possible. So that's the end of that slide. Um, I'm ready for questions if you have anything else. Uh, I think, Isabel, you wanted to maybe possibly ask something? Uh, yeah, um, I have a follow-up question. Uh, so you mentioned how, you know, we need to try to feel comfortable in this new virtual setting. Um, and I was wondering what are the kinds of things that people are, you know, asking you about, the kind of things that people feel like they need to improve? Um, 
in order to be effective in a virtual setting? Maybe you can give us a few examples. Sure. Uh, so I, that's maybe the number one thing that I'm getting asked about right now, mostly still with German clients, but it's slowly expanding. How can I sort of produce this event that's coming up? And uh, people are asking, first of all, what do I have to know? It goes back to that first column. How do I sit? How do I look? How do I run the meeting? How do I, you know, if I'm a participant in the meeting, what do I have to know about sharing my screen, about looking in the camera? Basic stuff, really, but still very important. And then the second thing is people are coming to me now, especially after this VIS thing that I did, uh, where we trained all these teams. Uh, they're coming to me for what's called this intentional speaking voice. And this is where you don't use the up talk, but you use you know, the sort of voice dynamics to deliver a clear, warm, intentional message, and then you stop at the end and you make a pause. And then you go to the next one. So it's a combination of the technical skills, how do you engage with the medium, and then also how can I come across as well? I'm also doing slide design and story structure, but that's it on that side. Also, one final thing uh, is that a lot of startups now are asking, can you help us build this, the, the pitch? Because right now you don't need to be in the room with people. That's the beautiful thing about the room being exploded. You know, Corona took a flamethrower to the room, but now the room is anywhere I am. It's anywhere you are. We can do anything virtually now. So people come to you because the brain is what's in the room. My brain is right here. Your brain's maybe in New Zealand, but we can build a pitch together. What else? Um, or do we have no time? I think maybe one more follow-up question. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned the, at the beginning the importance of, of looking at the camera, which I, I admit I really struggle with. Um, so I'm, think, I'm wondering if, you know, since now we're limited to sort of our face because we don't have any other body language in a virtual setting, are there any kinds of acting skills that lawyers can work on? Yes. Mainly I'll facial make, expressions? Yeah, I'll make this quick because I don't want to eat into anybody else's time. Uh, I think I have about a minute. 80 seconds, is that about right? Okay, I'm, I was trying to watch the clock. So here's the great news, everybody. Uh, after spending 10 years becoming a great lawyer, you do not need to become an actor. <laughs> uh, I was an actor for 10 years in you know, elementary school, high school, college and stuff, and that helped in terms of you know, developing the soul and you know, getting rid of fear and things like that. And I would say if anybody who's in this meeting tonight, if you have a chance to do an improv class anywhere in your neighborhood or an acting class, please do it. It is a beautiful, you know, developmental tool and it helps you just get rid of all your boundaries. Uh, but what I would say is let's think about what actors and maybe television presenters and teachers even at the front of a classroom, what do they do? What skills are they using to engage us and communicate their messages? One is presence and two is uh, directional action and intentional speaking. So when you're on a stage, you do have that stage presence and you've got to be careful that you you know, you sort of act the part. You don't have to act. I'm not asking anybody to act, but you've got to be aware of the presence that you have. And the second thing is intentional action. If you study acting, it's all about, you know, what are you doing in the scene? Where's the actor going? Where's the camera going? All that stuff. Online, it's about the voice again. What message are you sending? And how are you creating? You know, right now when I'm speaking, I'm looking in the camera. How am I creating a combination of engaging, dynamic modulation with my voice, but also you know, making it a little bit warm and interesting and something that somebody wants to listen to. This is the question. How do we sort of master these basic techniques of how to be present, as the Germans say, and master the room before you enter it? That's really, uh, I think that's all I wanted to say. Voice and presence. Thank okay. you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, it's been very helpful. And if you have any other questions, we'll take them at the end. But now let's, let's turn to the council perspective. Um, so Tom is gonna share with us his experience with recent virtual hearings, um, as recent even as yesterday, I think. Um, <laughs> and, yes. you know, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. The, the first observation I'll make is, I wish I'd met John about 12 weeks ago, because I learned a great deal in the last uh, 10 minutes. So thank you, John. I'm going to start my presentation with, with showing you something that's a favorite of mine um, uh, in terms of legal drama, but I also think it's a great example of how things have changed and it really picks up on John's point about the room disappearing. So I just want you all to watch this clip and then we'll have a quick discussion about it. Isabel, back to you.
copy of Colonel. You snotty little bastard. Your Honor, I'd like to ask for a recess. I'd like an answer to the question, Judge. The court will wait for an answer. If Lieutenant Kendrick gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched, then why did he have to be transferred? Colonel, Lieutenant Kendrick ordered the code red, didn't he? Because that's what you told Lieutenant Kendrick to do. Object! And when it went bad, you cut cases. these guys loose! Your Honor, you Johnson, have Marcus inside your a contempt. bony transfer! Your Honor, you doctored the logbook! Damn it, Captain! You coerced the doctor! Consider you yourself in contempt! You. Colonel Jessup, did you order the code red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! <laughs> and handle the truth! Thanks, Isabel. So, for those of you who are too young to remember that film, um, it's, it was brought out in 1992 and it was a classic legal drama at the time, and that was probably the most famous scene. What it reminds me of now is that simply wouldn't work virtually. And you can imagine if uh, John was naturally the Tom Cruise character, uh, and I was the crusty prosecutor and Janet was the judge and Isabel was Colonel Jessup, how it would be if all four of us were talking at the same time, loudly, raising arms up in the air, slamming our fists on the table um, with Isabel telling us we couldn't handle the truth. It, it simply wouldn't work. And from what I've seen over the last six to eight weeks in the, in the virtual hearings that I have done, even the smallest over-talking has, has, has been disastrous. So for me, that's a very neat way of, of putting into practical visual terms the point that John has made about the room disappearing. And what that really means is all of the skills that, that we as advocates have developed over a period of hundreds of years that have been handed down from generation to generation, they no longer exist and they've disappeared literally overnight. The kind of skills that I'm talking about are the bullying that you do sometimes as an advocate when you need to, when you're in a, in, in a bad corner and you need to blast your way out with a bit of bombast. Uh, the charm that you sometimes need to, need to play in when your client's done something wrong and you've got to come up with a nice explanation to get around it. Those kinds of skills are a lot harder to deploy virtually. Another example is this. Uh, like, like many advocates and many um, junior advocates who are on a team, I've always had a, a very clear eye on the entire room. I've wanted to see how the judges or arbitrators are reacting to arguments. I've wanted to see how the adversaries on the other side of the room are reacting. Are they getting worried? Are they taking notes? Are they falling asleep? I've also wanted to look at my colleagues. Are they looking at me thinking, this crazy guy's lost it completely, he needs to stop? Or this is going really well, I like what I'm hearing. All of that has either disappeared entirely or now manifests itself in, in different ways. I think the, uh, the, the most practical example uh, of old skills that has gone is um, tugging your colleague who's doing the talking and handing them a nice little neatly written note that synthesizes your thoughts. Uh, I, I've always enjoyed colleagues who are good at doing that and got very frustrated with colleagues who are bad at doing that. That's now disappeared and it's back to WhatsApp. To, to, to get messages from colleagues. So uh, those are some examples of old skills that, that, that are out the door. W what are the new skills then? What's replaced that? Well, for me, it's, um, it's, it's a combination of things. Uh, I, I think probably the most significant for me would be these principles. Um, the, the requirement to be nimble has always been something that an advocate has had to have in their armory. For me, that has increased uh, manifold and, and, it, and it ranges from little things like that. When Isabel was putting up the, the slide and the video to start and it, it, uh, she teased us all by pretending it wasn't going to work the first time around. What I have noticed in, 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 in virtual hearings is uh, people and legal teams who are not nimble, who see things like that and start to panic. Uh, it's so obvious. So if you're, if you're sitting there on a screen like this and something's going wrong, and you look in a very frustrated, concerned way as what's happening, everybody will see. In the old days, you could all get away with that and no one would notice. Another thing uh, is with respect to documents and being nimble with that. It, it, what I have seen over the last five, six years is that a number of advocates have started to use electronic bundles, 
some have stuck to hard copy bundles and some have sort of dabbled in a bit of both. Now, uh, if you're going to be a virtual advocate, to me, you've got to know both bundles and be able to use both at the same time because you just don't know what's going to happen during the course of a hearing. The electronic bundle system may stop working or you may get a very old crusty judge or arbitrator who just doesn't like electronic bundles and has used the hard copy bundles. And trying to make up for that difference virtually is impossible compared to when you're in the same room. Uh, another example is this. If you, if you think of this, if, you, if you're an advocate that's got 35, 40 years experience and a huge reputation, you could essentially walk into court with a pretty grubby suit, your hair everywhere, a terrible tie, and start talking and everyone would just listen to you because you're that famous lawyer. Uh, if you were a young kid, uh, you could walk into court with a fabulous suit on, a really nice smile, a perfectly cut tie or great suit, and it wouldn't matter. Uh, your, your voice would not be heard. Now I can tell you that presentation is so important in a, in a different way. And without naming names, one of the hearings I've done recently involved a very illustrious lawyer. Uh, but uh, this lawyer, and I won't give you the gender because that may give it away, spent most of the hearing with a view like this. And I can tell you, uh, <laughs> we had a clear view of nasal hairs and teeth uh, and the florid complexion and, and not much of this illustrious lawyer. Um, meanwhile, the opponent uh, was very well presented, young lawyer, um, presenting for one of the uh, co-defendants in the case I was involved in, had a great camera set up, good lighting, was very well organised. And it reminded me a little bit of a, of a TV news studio in the way that she presented. And that presentation did away with 35 years of reputation uh, in one moment because the presentation wasn't bad. Uh, sorry, wasn't good. So those are, those are some of the things that, that I have observed in terms of the old skills not working and the new skills that you, you would require. And I will tell you that that's only on 10, 12 weeks of experience that I've had. It's been a very steep learning curve. I think it will continue for myself to, uh, to, to be that kind of steep learning curve. And I think it will take a long time before we've all developed with, with help of with people like John and hearing from the people that count the most arbitrators like Janet. Um, but I think it's new. I think it's exciting. I think it's opened up a whole new world for lawyers. I think we're very lucky that we've been able to continue practicing law in these times when so many of our uh, friends and families have had to stop working. And so I think it's something to be embraced and enjoyed. Isabel, I, I don't know where I'm up to the clock as my colleagues will always tell you I'm terrible at sticking to my time breaking I might observe one of John's golden rules that I'll have to work on I still I think we have a time for a few follow-up questions for you um, thank you so I know that you've had experience in both uh, in the virtual setting in both uh, arbitration hearings and court trials so do you see any big difference between the two is one of them more challenging than the other I, I have seen differences, yes, and, and, and some of them are logistical and some are once you're in the virtual courtroom. I think on the logistical side, because arbitration is a creature of the party's agreement, and uh, I, I say this with deep respect for the, for, the, for the judiciary, I find arbitrators a, a little more innovative and because they are providing a service and a competitive service, they are constantly looking at ways to improve. So, for example, electronic bundles were something that arbitrators embraced well before judges. So what I found is that has an impact upon the system you use. Do you use Zoom? Do you use Skype for business? Uh, do you have an outside provider involved? Do Opus put the documents up? With arbitration, it's really down to the parties and it's more of a discussion. With court, it, you need a lot more lead-in time and you often spend a lot of time persuading judges through their clerks that this is the way to do things. So that I think is from a practical point of view. From, from a court point of view, I've always found that I've done a lot more virtual witness uh, testimony in arbitration than I have in court. So I think a lot of judges are finding the whole thing quite new, whereas a lot of arbitrators have, have been accustomed to it. The other thing is things are more informal in arbitration. So the fact that we have to be a little bit more informal in this new world, 
I, I think is easier through arbitration. And I'll give you one practical example that caused me a lot of problems. I turned up for my first test uh, before a large commercial court trial in a hoodie. It was the day before the hearing, I was working hard. I got on to the test call, having done one in an arbitration and everyone turned up quite casually to see that the judge and every single lead counsel had a suit and tie on. Um, and then the judge started asking me a question about the procedure for the case, which was rather embarrassing. So uh, I've turned up with ties to every single test since then for, for court hearings. So I wouldn't say that differences are material, but they are sufficient to, to, for, for me to say this, just because you've done a virtual court hearing, don't assume it will be same for an arbitration and, and, and vice versa. Thank you. Um, and I think you've also had experience between different types uh, of proceedings, injunctions, mm. uh, procedural hearings. Maybe you can tell mm. us a little bit about that as well. Yes, uh, I've had very good experience of hearings, both in court and on arbitration, that are more focused on legal issues uh, and presentation of, of, of legal arguments. Those I've actually found the, the differences between being in a room and not being in a room less. So the injunction hearing that we did in the Motorola case, uh, we had a very, uh, a very good judge who was very organised, was um, well prepared, you know, pretty experienced counsel for all of the parties and, and it worked quite smoothly because we really were making legal submission and all we were really referring to is case law. Uh, I've had two cases, one in the commercial court and one as an arbitration where we've had a flotilla of witnesses for both parties, cross-examination via translators in multiple jurisdictions. And I found that a lot more challenging and had to really adapt, abandon old skills and, 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 and come up with new ones. So for example, with cross-examination, a lot more sort of machine gun, short questions, getting to the point quickly over a number of, um, a number of questions rather than long-winded things. So yes, there is a real stark difference. And I, and I think if you're doing legal arguments, uh, it's a lot easier. And I think if you're doing trials, it's a lot harder. Thank you. Um, and I think maybe one, one final question before we turn to Janet. Um, sure. We're having this discussion, you know, in the context of the lockdown and social distancing, um, which will hopefully um, end at some point. Um, so what is, what do you see virtual hearings, um, like what do you think they will continue to play a big role after the lockdown? Yes, I do. I mean, I think they're, they're, they're great in the sense that they've shown us we can do it virtually and that we do not have to uh, be all in the same room to, to dispense with justice. So I think that's a positive. Uh, I also think, however, there's a reason we've done it the way we have for 350, 400 years. And I do think particularly with trials and particularly where cases swing on the credibility of witnesses, we will still do in-person trials for a lot of our cases. I think that what virtual trials and virtual hearings will allow us to do is to do more work and do it more efficiently. Before, before the word processor, before the photocopier, before hyperlinks, uh, before USB sticks, before box, before email, uh, law was, was perfectly good, but all of those things improved us. And I think virtual hearings will have a good presence for things like procedural hearings, urgent injunctions, hearings where we've got arbitrators in, in a wide range of jurisdictions. So I think, I think that will just make us better at dispensing justice and more attractive to our clients, but they won't replace uh, what we've done. That, that's my humble view of things. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank um, you, Isabel. So I think now we will turn to Janet um, to see the arbitrator's perspective. Um, so all of this discussion is irrelevant if without the perspective of, of the one in the receiving end of the virtual advocacy. Um, Janet has kindly shared with us a photo of where she sits during virtual hearings, which I am going to share with everybody. Here. Thank you so much, Isabel. I, I thought it would be helpful just to start the comments to see sort of the physical setup so you can see uh, the hearing from my perspective, in a sense. Uh, you'll see those sort of 
little uh, pictures on the wall, which uh, gives away the clue that this is um, a, an unused uh, additional bedroom in the house that's been converted to a little studio. It's a quiet place. Um, I think the big thing is the larger the screen, uh, the better off you are. So it's not entirely clear uh, from this perspective, but indeed the screen where the participants are, the main screen, uh, is uh, just a smart TV. You know, I think it's a 55 inch smart TV, which is pretty standard. And now that we don't have um, families coming in from out of town to, to visit, uh, uh, we haven't got need of that additional TV. And it's very useful because even in gallery view with many participants there, their faces are, are sort of well positioned. The little um, laptop or not so little laptop uh, to my right is actually driving that main screen. I'm, sh main screen. I'm sure that there will be uh, some among uh, this younger group who will recognize the emblem on the screen and might wonder why uh, you know, an arbitrator uh, would think of having a gaming laptop as a regular piece of equipment. And indeed, maybe one day I will aspire to that pastime. Uh, but it is particularly useful because it has a very strong graphics card. And that's what you need, I think, to drive all of the moving images and do so efficiently. Uh, that's the screen um, on which this particular image is now of the hearing room is now appearing for me. And that's the screen on which I usually see the documents are displayed so that they do not interrupt the uh, main uh, screen of participants. Um, some, at some point, I will also consider uh, trialing the real transcript, uh, uh, real time transcript on that screen. But at the moment, it's just a window on the main screen. It will depend upon how the feeds come in and what works best. Um, and to the left, what you'll see is another screen uh, with a laptop attached to it. That's my own personal laptop. It's very, very helpful for me to have my own set of the electronic bundle um, and possibly a window set up or often a window set up where a chat is uh, ongoing with the other arbitrators. So that uh, you know, the, the picking the, the, the WhatsApp um, uh, chat off the desk and having a look at the screen is not necessary. I can keep an eye to that um, as we go forward. The other important thing is uh, that with the two, uh, um, the system on the right, um, uh, that is running actually the virtual hearing, the system on the left, whatever I might have running in the background, email, who knows what's going on there and some of those apps that will not interfere with the main screen. Uh, also really important is to have these hardwired into the wall. Whatever connection you have, I mean, I know we now are making uh, the term Wi-Fi synonymous with internet connection, but indeed very helpful to dig out that uh, hard line uh, from, your, from the back of the closet and plug it in. Whatever reception you have uh, will be uh, increased in terms of reliability and strength if you have it actually plugged into the modem or into the wall. Uh, and you see there uh, a camera that's on a tripod so that I may not be looking precisely at you at any given moment, but I'm looking somewhere in the vicinity uh, of you uh, most of the time. It also avoids the uh, visible nose hair problem that some people might have. Uh, and sitting on the desk in front of me is, uh, is just a little uh, speaker. I mean, yes, if you can't find a quiet room, you'll want a headset uh, and uh, with a speaker microphone, a microphone and, uh, and the, the earpiece. But if you can uh, manage to get a quiet room, I just find it more comfortable and longer hearing to, uh, to work with a separate uh, a webcam and speaker. So that was the physical setup. Just it helps, I think, to get a sense for the actual room that your arbitrator might be sitting in so that you know what you're actually making your, your case to. Um, so you had a number of questions, Isabel. Yes, thank you so much, Janet. Um for showing us, uh, you know, quite literally the arbitrator's perspective in virtual hearings. Um, so I think the first question is just to, to see whether, you know, based on what, what John and Tom have been discussing, uh, are there any other things you, you think from your perspective that lawyers can do to improve and be more effective uh, advocates in a virtual setting? Perhaps I can uh, pick up on a few of those themes and, uh, and respond to them. Uh, but before I do, uh, let me say that for all of uh, those here from ICDR, Y&I, and, um, and also a message to Tom and his colleagues uh, and in, the, in the first chair, don't be afraid to ask for an opportunity to do some of the advocacy. 
it really actually adds value in, especially in a virtual setting. Uh, whether you're second chair, third chair, just ask. Say, I would like to take that witness. Witness, I would like to take that issue on the submissions. It's not quite the same uh, confusion as it might once have been when people sort of uh, begin to speak or stop speaking. Uh, focusing on uh, a new face when it's dealing with a particular witness or focusing on a new face when it's dealing with um, a, a particular issue can, I think, actually uh, keep the energy going for arbitrators. And, you know, as was the case in the, in the olden days, um, indeed, if you are focused on a particular witness, uh, there is uh, an increased chance that uh, you will actually have a complete mastery of the issues that affect that witness and, and do a really, really good job. So my experience of that, just as, as Thomas said, you know, the ability to put yourself in the right frame, you know, get yourself uh, properly attired and present effectively is not limited to the very senior advocates anymore. Now, especially that the, the drama, the sort of taking control presence that, that used to be uh, sort of the hallmark of a great advocate is no longer quite the same uh, measure of success. Yep. So um, if I could make actually you know, three, three little points though, sorry about, about that larger point, but three little points. Absolutely, Tom, uh, uh, the drama is no longer the critical feature. So what does that mean? What does that leave us with? I think that leaves us with a greater premium to be placed on the real forensic skill, the analytic skill that's gone into uh, developing that cross or in uh, positioning that argument. And so I think that there's much greater emphasis on that. Uh, once, you know, once again, technology has taken charge of everything and there is no talking over. As soon as that happens, even with two people, I don't have to pause people and say, you know, the report is having a challenge with this. The, the system takes care of that. So it's important then to be able to frame the question clearly, know when to stop the question, uh, being able to intervene at the moment's pause with the witness. Otherwise, they will continue forever into the distance and you'll never get a word back in edgewise. Uh, so there is a, a, a deft technique to it, but being very, very clear at what you're doing and very, very, uh, I think, uh, surgical about it is, is all the more important. The documents, at the risk of sounding a bit crusty, I was getting actually quite comfortable with the electronic uh, bundle. But now, uh, sometimes there's just a lot to manage with all of this, the screens. Um, at the moment, uh, I'm going a little bit easy on counsel because for some of them, it can represent real hardship for junior counsel to assemble that document in hard copy and get it, and get it to me. Uh, you know, it means to sort of uh, coming out of whatever sheltering they're doing and, and mixing it up uh, in a, a place that they don't want to be. Uh, so I'm sort of, you know, dealing with that. In one case, it's coming up next week. I said, it's all right. We'll go with the electronic bundle. Please don't trouble yourself. Uh, but indeed, I think you'll find that arbitrators, you know, in managing all of the technology, will actually find it helpful to be able to refer to that hard copy bundle um, uh, themselves. And finding the team, uh, absolutely right finding ways to engage with your team effectively uh, throughout the arbitration is going to be, I think, one of the next great challenges for everyone. Uh, yes, the, the notes will not be able to be passed definitely up to the lead chair or the person leading the cross, but indeed, finding a way to get yourself positioned effectively on the chat, I think, will be a good alternative. Those are sort of the, the three points that I wanted to pick up on. Thank you, Janet. Um, I actually want to follow up on, I think it was the first point uh, that you made. Um, and I, I wonder if virtual hearings in a way can be more helpful to arbitrators, um, because as you said, you know, they remove some of these other elements that are, are not really relevant to the case, um, like the physical appearance, and also in the sense that lawyers will really need to focus on the main issues and the main arguments. I think that that's right. Um, it depends on sort of how you approach a case. But uh, it doesn't matter how many participants are in the case now, they all appear on that little screen. It's not a great sea of faces disappearing into the distance. And so they all um, are, are, are up front and uh, uh, very, very present to uh, the tribunal. 
um, they need not worry, they need to focus very intently on certain aspects of their presentation and certain parts of their appearance, but they need not focus on, you know, uh, as much on, you know, how they dress. No one's going to see if your shoes are scuffed or you've got a hole in your stockings. That's, that's history. Uh, but they can focus on, in fact, actually speaking to the tri tribunal, speaking directly uh, to the tribunal. Um, I've, uh, I've noticed, for example, that uh, I've, ta I've now taught a little course as well, an arbitration course online to our graduate program. And every student has a, a front row seat. And isn't that wonderful? And now every advocate has that front row seat as well. And so I think there is, a, I won't say a leveling, but a real uh, sense of opportunity for a greater range of, of, of advocates. The other thing I might mention is, unlike in the past, every time someone speaks, mm -hmm. their name is front and center. So that's the thing. I never wonder, you know, oh my goodness, what was that name of that person in the second chair who I've not met before? I know, Isabel, I know, Miss San Martin, I know, and you know you're right there, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Sprang, I know you're right there. Um, the one thing you should also be aware of and not be offended about is that if there are a number of people on the screen, they will move around. And so, where I might go back if there's a number of advocates and go back to the rebuttal, knowing which place the person is sitting in, you will have moved all around the screen for me. And so I have actually experienced this where I've gone back after a number of advocates have been appearing for one side and invited the wrong person to reply uh, it, to the uh, person on the other side. Thanks for, for sharing that. Um, I also, I wanted to, to ask you, um, as arbitrator, whether you find it a little bit harder maybe to intervene in a virtual setting? Because in person, we often see, you know, the chair turning on the microphone and everybody will suddenly kind of wait to listen. Um, so do virtual hearings make it a little bit more difficult for you in that sense? I think they, they call upon us to develop a slightly new etiquette. So where um, we, I might once have never raised a hand to someone, you know, a sort of a gentle indication might actually be a, of assistance. Um, certainly, there's no need to uh, raise the volume. Uh, and, in, and in that uh, sense, it's hoped that the, the tension in the room will, the, sort of the heat and light in the room will also uh, remain in a relatively uh, moderate level. But you're, you're right, we need to develop new techniques. And I'm not sure that, that any of us has completely mastered that. We, We'll develop those new techniques, and we'll we'll come to uh, appreciate a new etiquette as well. Just just as as Tom was uh, learning about what the dress code is for test uh, test meetings, this is this is a new world, and we will see that evolve over time. Do you wear jacket without tie? Do you wear tie without jacket? All of these things are are a fresh challenge for us. Yep. And um, what about the participation about the uh, among the tribunal members? Uh, I don't know if you've had experience with that. Um, is that, you know, harder to maybe resolve like a small procedural issue on the spot or things like that? Um, it's, it is a, that's a bit of a difficult learning curve for a, a number of arbitrators because it's so much easier just to look to your right, look to your left, and, and just with that kind of a check, know exactly uh, what is needed. The, the chat function, um, not I would say not on the main hearing uh, room because that sort of chat privately uh, system has always made me nervous just as reply, reply all in the, uh, in the broadcast messages. But some sort of separate uh, um, communication where people can type has worked well for me. Um, the other thing is um, I've not done this, I've not managed it myself, but uh, typically there's a call operator and simply asking if the breakout rooms are set out, uh, set up um, effectively before the, the hearing is, is ongoing, then just asking, can we pause for five minutes and speak separately? And then we'll all be put into the breakout rooms, or at least the tribunal will be put into a breakout room. And I'm confident then that it will be uh, just a brief discussion. I will say that that is much more effective than it used to be. To say in, uh, you know, in a physical hearing, we're going to go to our breakout rooms. We're going to go to our retiring room to have a discussion. 
that can't be done in under 30 minutes, uh, you know, under 20 or 30 minutes, even for, you know, a two minute discussion. But those breakout rooms can be very efficient. Um, and maybe just one final question before we, we turn to some questions from the audience. Um, I guess um, I'd like to hear, you know, the same question that I asked Tom, um, you know, what, from your perspective, what do you think is, is going to be the role of virtual hearings once the lockdown is over? I don't want to discourage us, but I think they're here to stay. Now, I, you know, I, I, will, I will sort of put a, a caveat on that. I think for procedural meetings, they're absolutely here to stay. In fact, uh, in, in recent times, the, the conversation on the email has been, should we have a call about that? By that call, we assume now that it's a Zoom call. But there can be some confusion about that. But I think the, the assumption about it being a video call uh, is actually uh, increasing. Uh, so I think for procedural meetings, they're brilliant. And um, I'm struggling to think now, uh, other than a rare case, where it would be a, tele a teleconference that we would revert to. Um, but for main, uh, for, for main evidentiary hearings, it will be horses for courses. And uh, I can see some remote participation or hybrid uh, hearings, which is now developing as well, where council teams can gather together in one spot. Maybe the arbitrators can be together in another and another council team elsewhere. But it will vary. It will be a, a whole sort of kaleidoscope of options, I think, in, in the years ahead. And we will see much greater efficiencies for that. I can be in a meeting here today. Uh, where are we today? Are we in New York? And Hong Kong tomorrow and London, you know, the day after, without you know a, a moment's hesitation. Sometimes that does mean getting up in the wee hours in the morning, uh, you know, if I draw the short straw. But but it, it is a very very effective and very efficient way of meeting. John, I see that you want to say something. <laughs> I just had a quick uh, addendum to what she was saying. I've got a whole separate section of coaching that I do called Walk the Talk, where I don't have video and I don't have physical. I just take a walk in the park next to my house and I've got my headset on because the executive or the startup guy just wants to discuss strategy and kind of world building in this mental space. And for that, I actually don't need a video call. And it's actually preferable. It's almost like talking to my mom. You know, I don't need to see my mom when I'm talking to her because we have 40 years of shared experience, 50 years. And I just love to hear her voice and sit on the sofa and you know, do this world building mentally. I really like that. Uh, it might be old world, you know, like when you were in high school and you just sit on your bed talking to your girlfriend, right? I mean, it's a powerful uh, em emotional experience to share a vocal connection with somebody. And those are the times when I really don't need the video chat. So as a, just as a, as a side thing. Thank you. Um, I think we, we don't have a lot of time, but let me see. Um, we have a question from the audience about what they call part virtual hearing. So I guess the hybrid um, that uh, Janet was mentioning. Um, and I guess they wanna know how does that work? Is it, I guess, is it better than going like fully virtual uh, or should we like our virtual, you know, hybrid uh, hearings also good or? Well, I would think with the council teams, if they're able to be actually together in the same room, and this is all a question of, you know, what's permissible under the, in any given place under the current regulations and so on. But if they're able to be together, I think that that's for them uh, the greatest challenge that they're going to be facing in the time ahead. And so, but, but it may be far more convenient for them to be in their hometown if it's a, a, a team that's located in one place. Um, and the same with the other team. Uh, we will have issues, of course, you know, about uh, imbalances where the witness is in the same room as uh, examining counsel. That's one thing where the witness is in the same room as uh, if they are a party um, as, uh, the, uh, as their own counsel. That's going to be another issue, especially where you know, the other team is, is operating remotely. So there will be a whole complex set of issues about uh, balancing the options there. Um, and I'm um, sure yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Janet. I, I think from sort of a council's perspective, clients will be very leery about notions of uh, equality. So if there's a witness who's physically in the room with the tribunal and one council team, 
there's likely to be an objection. So I think hybrids will be difficult to impose unless there's, there's a perception that there's, there's, there's equality. And, and, and I kind of think, I don't think it'll, that will mean that there won't be any hybrid hearings, but I, I think there'll probably be um, a lot more, one of each extreme, either virtual hearings or in-person hearings, maybe with the odd witness coming in virtually if they're in-person hearings. But I think, I think hybrids will be, will be tricky. I, I personally don't think there's a great deal to the, the supposed advantage, but um, we all know that in high value, highly contentious cases, uh, everybody thinks every little inch counts. So uh, I, I think that will be a problem. And it will depend upon the case. I mean, if we've got mm, uh, yeah. one party and its counsel based in Singapore, another party and its counsel based in London, and the arbitrators, who knows where, uh, you know, if they are both uh, operating together from a different place and the arbitrators are not in the same place as either of them, then, then that's, uh, I think, going to be considered an important sort of balancing effect. I think we'll also see, you know, where you have that situation, team in Singapore, team, team in London. You know, if you have one arbitrator who's based in Singapore, they'll say, well, that's fine, but they need to be in a different room. And that's how we'll start seeing things balancing out. Yep. Um, maybe the last question from the audience. Um, they want to know whether the use of, of slides or other materials is encouraged in a virtual <laughs> hearing. I guess in a way it can stop you from seeing everyone else, uh, seeing the video. I don't know uh, it depends what your preference on, is. It depends on how it's being projected. And uh, I just I'm going to use a small point, but uh, the person who's affectionately known as the document jockey who may be a, a member of the team or, or a service provider, it's great if they have a need. So you could just say, you know, um, you know, Samantha Paul, oh, would you mind, you know, coming back to that, uh, that document? Um, or can you give me some guides about where to find it? Um, but uh, I think the, the PowerPoints are as useful or, or otherwise as they always have been. It depends on how they're used. Um, and, and yes, ideally they won't be, uh, uh, replacing the screen of the person speaking to me. That's, I think, critical. Yeah. My, my, my view on slides and indeed documents is that, the, the, like many things, the rules have changed. And, and, and those who have spent a lot of time with English lawyers or in English courts will be familiar with a lot of English advocates presenting by saying, uh, could you please look at this document and read this bit? And could you please look at the document and read? For, for me, that's much more difficult virtually, thank goodness, in my humble view. And what you now need to do is you need to know the document better. You have to summarise what you think is the essential part and give them the reference and cut down probably by 90% your reliance on just showing people documents because it's just so cumbersome and it's really boring. Um, it's boring in court, but virtually it's just... 10 times more boring is, is, is my view. You want me to say 30 seconds on just maybe expanding if you want the to hearing yep. thing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I am not actually in virtual hearings. I don't go to meetings. I don't go to legal proceedings, but you know, I'm always the guy before or after. But I, I really have to say, if you're putting slides up on the wall or in the virtual hearing, uh, Tom is right. It's absolutely boring. That's the first part. You need to put less stuff on there. And second of all, third of all, you've got to make sure that the delta between what you're saying and what they're looking at is absolutely minimized. Because if you put a document in front of people, they're going to start scanning. You know, they do the F scan. They do the top, left, and they go down. It looks like an F, right? Like that. And if people start scanning a document and then you're talking on a separate channel that sort of has something to do with it, but you don't know where they are, that is extremely <laughs> disturbing for people. When you do it in a room, we're all used to it, and we've seen horrible PowerPoint presentations the last 20 years, but when you do this virtually and the guys or somebody is looking at a text on a screen and you're talking sort of like the narrator from off screen and they don't know where you are, that's, that should be avoided at all costs. So less text and more uh, fidelity and uh, stickiness to what's on the content. That's what I would say. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to, to maybe end with a very quick round, uh, just each of you maybe giving us like one final tip for conducting good e-advocacy or, or maybe what, you know, to avoid 
Um, maybe we can start in reverse order. So Janet, then Tom, and then John. I'm not going to propose to uh, give any guidance to this group because I think this group will figure it out far better than we have. And they will come up with new techniques and uh, new ways forward that uh, I think will be very, very effective in, in the years ahead. Tom? <laughs> Oh, I think you're on mute. That's my tip. Always take yourself off mute. No, I'll take the plunge and, and, and try and come up with, with, with one tip. I, I was, I was, it was in, uh, it was made very clear to me in my early years as an advocate that it was, it was a lot, a lot more about perspiration. In other words, working hard than the moments of brilliance. Um, uh, I, I think, that is even more true with virtual hearings because the, the, the room for error is much smaller. Uh, the ability to persuade the, the, the tools that you have uh, have been reduced in number, but their effectiveness is a lot more acute. Uh, so if, if you're a hard worker already, that, that's fine. If you're not, you better start being, because I, I think it's a bigger challenge uh, to do a difficult job um, uh, virtually. John? Yeah, I would just, I guess, wrap up by saying uh, I agree with both <laughs> Janet and Tom. I think this group of people, from what I've experienced the last 10 years with the Moots and then uh, this April with the VIS, and this community is just incredibly intelligent, kind, uh, warm. You guys are all helping each other. I'm honored to be part of this community. You know, Anna's a friend of mine, Philip Wagner's a friend. I mean, they're just great people, and every time I meet people, it's just really nice people, you know, it's like law, but nice law, <laughs> friendly law, you know, and that's what Philip Wagner said, you know, uh, arbitration is the jazz of law, right? And it's just this, it's, it's a different form of using the law to find solutions and make the world a better place, right? So on the one hand, Janet, absolutely right. I don't feel like this group it needs anything. And I guess we're lucky to be spending maybe the next five, 10 years to be contributing to the community and we'll let them go on their own. Tom, also correct that you got very little room for error. But as one final point, I would say one, never just talk. You can't just talk anymore. You've got to be on an intentional curve where you know what you're going to say, you formulate it, and then you finish, and then you go to the next one. And then second of all, just, you know, the room idea, be in the room and be consciously, intentionally creating the room so that people feel welcome, you're hosting, you're guiding them, and you're leading them toward a solution. I'm honored to be here, happy to help. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. I think we're, we're out of time, um, but huge thanks to the three of you. It's been incredibly helpful. Incredibly helpful. I wish I'd learned some of these things before moderating <laughs> this panel. Um, and it's been an absolute <laughs> you did a pleasure. Great job. <laughs> thanks. Thank you, Isabel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And also thanks to our attendees for being so active in the chat. Um, have a great day, all of you. Thanks, Isabel. See you, everybody. Good luck. Bye. Thanks, See you, everybody. Janet. See you. Bye. Bye.